The first set of notes on this unit are on DNA structure and replication. Um, so DNA was discovered um, early on. There, it was known to be a molecule from way back when. Um, but the, the steps that we credit in discovering the, the function of DNA and how it worked uh, are related to these people that are on, the follow on these following slides. Frederick Griffith in 1928 did an experiment where he had two different um, strains of bacteria of the same species. One strain was uh, disease-causing or pathogenic and the other one was not. And what he found was that if he put the put some dead pathogenic bacteria in with the live non-pathogenic ones that the um, that the non-pathogenic ba living bacteria were transformed or changed into disease-causing by picking up some structure, some, some compound from um, from the dead pathogenic ones, and so this is called transformation. Um, and that was in 1928, and it took about, you know, it took this another 16 years before somebody figured out what it was that caused it. They didn't know whether it was a protein or whatever. And in 1944, Oswald Avery is credited with learning that the transforming molecule was DNA. And um, he did this by doing some experiments where he tagged the molecules with different kinds of radioactive compounds to see which one was picked up by the, by the bacteria that were transformed. Um, not long after that, another scientist named Erwin Shargaff uh, discovered some things about DNA. He discovered the amount of adenine, um, which is one of the nitrogen bases, was always equal to the amount of thymine, another base, and the amount of cytosine was always, uh, guanine was always equal to the amount of cytosine. And this is the, uh, evolved in something we now call Shargaff's base pairing rule in his honor, and we'll talk more about what that means. Uh, the next scientists to make a big discovery were Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase. In about 1952, they discovered that um, there was a particular kind of uh, virus called a bacteriophage that attacks um, bacteria. And um, they were trying to determine what it was about the bacteriophage virus that caused the bacteria to cause the disease, basically, in the bacteria. Um, and so he, they discovered that the genetic material was the uh, was the uh, DNA, um, and they did this similar to what um, Avery did in the, in that he t that they tagged the protein outer coat and the DNA internal part of the virus with different radioactive isotopes, and then d observed what part was picked up by the bacteria and found that it was the DNA. And also about the same time, a scientist who was working in, American scientist who was working in England named Rosalind Franklin, she was working with x-ray crystallogra crystallography. And she, uh, her pictures that she took of the DNA showed that the DNA was a double helix. It was a circle with an X in it that showed the kind of the crisscross pattern that we see in, if we look down the length of the DNA molecule. James Watson and Francis Crick are the ones that are credited with discovering the structure of DNA. And basically what they did was they took all these pieces of information that other people had discovered and used some ball and stick models, uh, some um, molecule models, to uh, figure out the eventual structure that we now know, uh, know as the structure of DNA. So a lot of people contributed to it. Watson and Crick are the ones that won the Nobel Prize for it, but they stood on the shoulders of people before them who had discovered other things. DNA is a nucleic acid. The name is deoxyribonucleic acid. It's named for the sugar that is found in it. It is a molecule that carries genetic information. When we look at cells that are not present, not dividing at the present time, you see the DNA as in the form of chromatin. Remember the DNA molecule is wound around the proteins called histones. We talked a little bit about this in our biochem unit. Uh, you only see DNA in the form of chromosomes when the cell is dividing. Another description of the DNA is that it's a string of genes. A gene is a sequence of DNA that codes for a particular protein chain. And so what you have in DNA is a string of genes, a string of instructions to make various kinds of proteins in the cell. Um, the unit of structure of DNA is a nucleotide. Each nucleotide is composed of three parts. It's composed of deoxyribose, which is a sugar, a five-carbon sugar, um, a phosphate group, and one of four nitrogen bases, and the four bases found in DNA are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. The nitrogen bases fall into two categories. These are called purines and pyrimidines, and that's based on the structure of the molecule. Purines have two rings in their structure. You see a, six, a, a hexagon and a pentagon attached together, and the pyrimidines have only one ring. 
the purines are adenine and guanine, and the pyrimidines are cytosine and thymine. Um, you need to remember which one is which. One way to help you remember which one is which is the sentence that we often use that says AGs are pure, A-G are pure, okay? That those are the purines. Um, you can also use thinking about purina, cat chow or purina, horse chow or whatever, uh, often is produced, it has agricultural uses, so AG in the purina will also help you remember that. Uh, the DNA molecule is a double helix. It's two chains of nucleotides that are bound together by hydrogen bonds between the complementary bases. And here we see adenine and thymine. Remember that we have purines and pyrimidines, and we always have one purine with one pyrimidine, but they're specific ones. Adenine always pairs with thymine. Cytosine always pairs with guanine. This is one nucleotide here that shows the nitrogen base, the sugar, and the phosphate. The sides of the of the ladder basically are alternating sugars and phosphates. The nitrogen bases are attached to the sugars, and then the complementary bases are held together by hydrogen bonds. In the case of thymine and adenine, it's um, two hydrogen bonds. In the case of cytosine and guanine, it's three bonds that hold them together. Uh, the two strands of DNA run in opposite directions. If we look at the uh, sugars that are found there, the, the, the carbons and the sugar are named starting with the oxygen and going in a clockwise manner. So this is number one, two, three, four, and the fi fifth carbon is the one that sticks up here, and that's the one that's attached to the phosphate, and the phosphate is up. On the other end, we've got the one, one, two, three, the third one is down, okay, it doesn't have the phosphate attached to it <coughs> at the bottom. And so we've got one side that goes from three and to three to five, and the other goes from three to five in the opposite direction. This is what we called, um, they just run in opposite directions to each other. So the, the, it's the way the sugar is, loca is facing on one side or the other. And this is significant in the way that DNA is read uh, when we learn about how this is read. Here are some newly published images of DNA. This is one DNA molecule that stretched between these, these posts here on this microscopic thing. This is a scanning electron micrograph that shows one molecule of DNA stretched across there. Here is a close-up of it, and you can actually see the spiral nature of the double helix there. So these are just published last year, and uh, it's the first time that we've actually seen one molecule of DNA and it actually confirms what we've seen about the structure, what we've learned about the structure of DNA. So how does DNA copy itself? It copies itself through a process called replication and that just means making identical copies of DNA. It's not like you have a copy machine exactly, but it's sort of like that in some ways. The, the steps in the process include the DNA unzipping there's an enzyme called helicase that actually unzips the DNA molecule in several different places. These are called replication forks and then new nucleotides are added from the 3' prime end um, by uh, the enzyme DNA polymerase, matching up the complementary basis. And so from one end, it's going to copy straight through. The other end, it has to copy piece at a time because it has to copy that from that 5 to 3 uh, part on the, new, on the new chain. The new nucleotides are connected together by an enzy another enzyme called ligase. Lots of enzymes involved here in this process. And then you end up with two uh, molecules that are half old and half new. The replication is what we call semi-conservative. That means semi means halfway and it conserves part of the old molecule. So here we have the old molecule um, in gray and then the new chains in red. And so it unzips and then each side is copied by, uh, by the enzyme DNA polymerase to produce two new DNA strands, each that are half original chain and half new chain. And this concludes the notes on DNA structure and replication.